Hello, Zachary here. If you're concerned about contracting a bacterial illness, I would suggest not getting any cuts, which brings up an interesting point about your skin. Your skin is composed of dead skin cells, which means that it provides a natural defense mechanism against foreign pathogens. But what this also means is that when you look at someone's face, you are literally looking into the face of death. But I digress. Anyway, if you're concerned about getting a bacterial infection, I would suggest not getting any cuts drinking purified water, eating well-cooked food, living in a sterile environment, and please use good hygiene techniques and staying a good distance away from people and animals. But taking these precautions can sometimes be a little bit misleading. If you've ever been told by a pediatrician to be more exposed to dirt and bugs, they are right if you want to develop a competent and robust immune system. However, in the case that these precautions aren't met and your immune system needs some help, we do have things called medications. And for bacterial infections, you would be given antibiotics, or in some cases, a vaccine for preventative measures. But even despite all these natural and supplementary aids, bacteria still persist. In some cases, neither the immune system nor antibiotics are effective against particular bacterial strains. A notable example is MRSA, M-R-S-A, which stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and it is a hallmark of what is known as the superbug also known as antimicrobial resistance. But I'm going to step back for a second and look at the history and mechanisms of penicillin, which was the very first truly identified set of molecules that exhibited antibiotic properties. So as the story goes, in 1928, the Scottish doctor and biologist Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin when he saw that there was a zone of inhibition in a petri dish that contained Staphylococcus aureus. It turns out that this lucky contamination was due to a type of fungus in the genus penicillin, which explains why it's called penicillin. Dr. Fleming did write a paper on his work, um, even though we did not have the personnel or the resources to successfully isolate the molecule from the mold, and he eventually gave up on his work, but little did he know how beneficial this discovery would be during World War II. In 1938, penicillin's potential was recognized by Dr. Howard Florey, a professor of pathology at Oxford University. To put it shortly, Florey and a number of others flew to America to try to convince the pharmaceutical industries to mass-produce this novel drug for extensive clinical trials. Eventually, the pharmaceutical companies did concede, and in 1943, the War Production Board took over the mass production of penicillin to supply to the Allied troops over in Europe. And it was miraculous. It worked very well. Through mass production methods, America is continually increasing its output of penicillin, the new drug that affects almost miraculous cures. That's all good to know, but how does penicillin actually work? First, to clarify some terms, penicillin is a family of molecules, not just one. Perhaps the most notable type is penicillin G, which was the one that was first discovered and is one of the most potent. All penicillins share a core chemical structure, which is this. The R group is what differentiates the various types of penicillin. The square you see in the middle is the beta-lactam structure, which is the very thing that gives penicillin its antibiotic properties. So most of the penicillins are useful against gram-positive bacteria, which are more vulnerable to antibiotic effects due to the rigid peptidoglycan makeup of their cell wall. And penicillin exploits this by inhibiting synthesis of the bacterial cell wall. So this happens when the beta-lactam structure in penicillin binds to a molecule called transpeptidase, which is an enzyme that is responsible for creating the peptidoglycan crosslinks. So now when the bacteria can no longer fill in the gaps of its cell wall, the osmotic pressure imbalance becomes so strong that the cell literally explodes um, in a process known as cytolysis. Now this is where bacteria get clever. So in response to the beta-lactam that inhibits the cell wall synthesis, bacteria, namely gram-negative ones, produce an enzyme known as beta-lactamase, which degrades the beta-lactam structure in penicillin and other uh, beta-lactam antibiotics. However, humans have made a comeback by creating beta-lactamase inhibitors, which inhibit the activity of beta-lactamase, which is responsible for degrading the beta-lactam structure in uh, beta-lactam antibiotics. And it's certainly a battle. Nowadays, some types of penicillin, particularly methicillin in MRSA or amoxicillin, have been shown to be ineffective against particular strains of bacteria that they had previously worked for. As you've probably heard, the major cause of antibiotic resistance is due to the inappropriate use of antibiotics. This is precipitated by beneficial mutations, perhaps brought about by selective pressures. And as the law of natural selection dictates, the beneficial mutations developed by this bacteria will live on in their progeny, and in some cases, the gene will transfer to another species, which is an example of uh, bacterial conjugation. Anyway, back to the point. 
Antibiotic resistance is a growing concern. At least in the year 2013, 2 million people were infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria in the United States, and 23,000 people died as a result. In some cases, even hospitals literally don't have any antibiotic options to treat their patients. That's scary. But what about the development of novel and more potent antibiotics introduced into the market? Well, the development of new antibiotics is startlingly unproductive. There's just not a big enough economic incentive for pharmaceutical companies to invest billions of dollars in the development of a new drug uh, that may or may not turn out to be successful. However, back in the good old 1980s, antibiotic development and production was prolific, with a whopping 16 new antibiotic drugs developed between 1983 and 1987, all of them FDA approved. And now, antibiotic development has reduced appreciably, with only two FDA-approved antibiotic drugs between 2008 and 2012. Various organizations such as the WHO are trying to galvanize the pharmaceutical industry to produce more antibiotics, because we need them. But still, there are other options besides antibiotics. My favorite is phage therapy. Oh, I love phage therapy. Phage therapy is the use of bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria rather than cells. Um, and they would be used to target specific pathogenic bacteria within the body. What's interesting about bacteriophages, though, is that they are one of, if not the most abundant organism on Earth, if you include viruses as being organisms. Anyway, just be sure to take precautions uh, for your health. Don't be overtly scared about antibiotic resistance for now. And make sure to consult with your doctor about using antibiotics um, when you think you have a viral infection, because antibiotics don't work uh, for viruses, they just um, they just don't. Also, don't try to intentionally abuse antibiotics. They are your friends for now. So I'm done with my lecture. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it.